Well, welcome to North Point. We're sure glad you're here today. You know, sometimes people will see our pictures on social media, but they've never visited in person. And they'll ask me, Aaron, is North Point really that happy? I mean, really? You guys just look genuinely joyful. Is that true? And to God's glory, the answer is yes. Unlike any other church I've ever seen, this is a place of happiness. There is a lot of celebration going on. And the reason is, we have the gospel. Gospel means good news. Glad tidings. God did these incredible things for us despite our absolute unworthiness. Why wouldn't we be happy? But on top of that, God continues to shower His blessings upon us. We don't deserve them. We could never pay God back. But He's been so good to us. And a great example of that is last week. We had two new arrivals at North Point. Yeah, praise God for that. Jarius and Jed were born a day apart. Moms and babies are happy and healthy. We've got at least three more moms expecting. So we're growing the church both ways. <laughs> the conventional way, teaching and baptizing people, and what I call the Catholic way, <laughs> is having as many kids as possible. <laughs> but we have a lot to rejoice about, and we're certainly thankful for Jarius and Jed. In less than two weeks, we're going to have our second annual basketball tournament. This is an in-house co-ed tournament. Last year, we had four or five teams. You play for a trophy. Even if you don't want to play, we hope that you'll come out. We'll have pizzas and desserts. Just a great time to fellowship with one another. That's Saturday, March the 16th from 4 to 8 at the Okalona Church Building. And so we hope that you'll make plans to, to be there. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, almighty God, we are just in awe of you. Your majesty, your power. You are the true God and without you we're nothing. We're so thankful for the new arrivals here at North Point. Pray that you'll continue to be with every family here. We pray, Father, that you'll help this church to stay focused on our mission, to seek and to save the lost to edify the saved, and we pray, Father, that it's all to your glory. Forgive us when we sin. We know we fall short. We pray now that you'll accept our worship as a sweet-smelling sacrifice. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Has anybody else had an experience like this when they were back in school? The teacher will give you an assignment and say, all right, there's absolutely no talking. You keep quiet. If you have a concern, simply raise your hand and I'll call on you. And so you get to working on your assignment, but after a few minutes, either you or a classmate needs to go to the restroom, and so they raise their hand. But by now, the teacher's distracted. She's not paying attention. She doesn't see the hand. And so at first, the hand is up high. Maybe you'll even wave it, trying to get her attention. But then after a few minutes... Your arm starts to slack a little bit. Then you start to do this. <laughs> and then before long, it's this. <laughs> you get tired of holding your arm up, don't you? And as we get older and stronger, maybe our endurance level increases. But still, it's hard to hold your arm up for any extended period of time, right? Even today, I tried it. I lifted my arm up, and after a minute, I'm like, whew, i got to stop that. <laughs> Do you know who holds the record for holding their arm up the longest? It's a guy named Amar Baarte. He's an Indian, lives in India, a devout Hindu, and allegedly, now I can't prove this, but there are a lot of sources, reputable sources who have interviewed him and others, allegedly, he has held his right arm up for 50 years. Here's a picture of the guy. You can tell his arm is deformed. Here's another picture. In 1970, he left his wife and children to devote himself entirely to the Hindu religion. A few years later, in 1973, as an act of devotion and in solidarity with a call to peace, he raised his right hand, vowing to never lower it again. 
He says that for the first two years, his arm and shoulder were in excruciating pain. But after about two years, he lost all sensation in his arm. And now it's just stiff. His hand curled up within itself. You can see that there. But allegedly, he has held his right arm up for 50 years. Can you even imagine that? Well, today we're going to look at the story of somebody who held their arm up, but for a far greater reason. His name was Moses, and he held his arm up so the children of Israel could prevail against their enemies. The story is found in Exodus 17, and I have to tell you, it's one of my favorite stories of the wilderness wanderings. There are a lot of great stories during that section of Scripture, but one of my favorites is this one. When Israel fought against the Amalekites, and God allowed them to prevail. If you're looking at the chapter, it divides neatly into two parts. Verses 1 through 7, confrontation from within. That is, it was an internal conflict. Verses 8 through 16, confrontation from without, meaning it was an external conflict. So the chapter divides neatly into two parts. We're going to look at the first 13 verses. First, the confrontation from within. Exodus 17, beginning at verse 1. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. The children of Israel have witnessed some incredible things. They saw the ten plagues brought against the nation of Egypt. They saw the Red Sea part miraculously. In just the last chapter, they saw God supply miraculous Krispy Kreme donuts from heaven. <laughs> you would think by now they'll get the message. Sit back. Let God do His thing. But over and over, I think this is the fourth time already in the book of Exodus, they're grumbling. They're murmuring. They're complaining against Moses and against God. This time, they come to Rephidim. Rephidim was not far from Mount Sinai. The word literally means rest stop or place of refreshment. Now, have you ever been maybe on a trip and you or someone in the car says, I've got to use the restroom. And so you see a sign or you look it up on the phone. Oh, there's a rest stop 20 miles down the road. But when you get to the rest stop, it's closed. Not must rest at the rest stop, right? Well, that's how it was at Rephidim. They come to Rephidim, the rest stop, but there's no water. The people are thirsty. And they start to have dread, right? What are we going to do? This isn't good. We're going to starve or we're going to thirst to death, they thought. And so they began to quarrel with Moses. That's a strong word, quarrel. They said to him, give us water to drink. He said to them, what do you expect me to do? Why are you quarreling with me? What you're really doing is testing God, he said. The people continued to grumble. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Was this some sick idea to bring us out here so we'll die in the wilderness? Well, Moses did the only thing he could do in that moment. He took it to God. He cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. Notice the Lord's response, verse 5. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. 
And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? So the people cry out to Moses. Moses cries out to God. God says, Moses, I hear you. I see what's going on. What I want you to do is pass on before the people of Israel. Go ahead of them with the elders. I want you to take your staff in hand. And when you come to a certain rock, I want you to strike the rock and it will give forth water. Again, God has already done incredible things. He's about to do another one. And so Moses goes out rod in hand. And in the sight of the elders, he strikes the rock. They called this place Massa, which means testing, and Meribah, which means quarreling. This would forever symbolize what took place there. But God had already supplied them with food. Now he miraculously supplies them with water. By the way, in 1 Corinthians 10, we see that this is a shadow and substance moment, a type, anti-type moment. The rock that provides true water, living water, is identified by Paul as Jesus Christ. This is a foretaste of that. And so Moses and God come through yet again. This was an internal conflict, right? This had the, the um, capability of dividing from within. But then we go to verse 8. On the heels of that confrontation, there's another confrontation. This one is external. Notice verse 8. Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the mountain. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. Did you know this is the first war of Israel in Scripture? Now with Egypt, God fought for his people. But now for the first time, God fights with his people. They have to pick up the sword and defend themselves. This is a great example of the cooperation in Scripture between God and man. Who is the source of our success? It's God, right? But that does not negate man's part. You have in this story God doing his part, but expecting the people to do their part. It's not an either or, it's an and both. Who was Amalek? Amalek was a descendant of Esau. We see that in Genesis chapter 36. The Amalekite people were a nomad people. They would roam around. They had a very nasty, vicious reputation. They preyed on the weak and vulnerable. Well, no sooner do they get over their water issue when they encounter another issue. The Amalekites begin to fight with Israel. This was unprovoked. Israel had done nothing wrong. But the Amalekites are watching. They're lurking, and they see an opportunity. What does Moses do? Well, Moses says to Joshua, I want you to choose some men. Select some men who can go and fight these people. Did you know this is the first mention of Joshua in Scripture? Now, we know Joshua was one of the greatest heroes of faith in the Bible. This is the first time we're introduced to him. And notice he's already got the respect of Moses. Moses goes to Joshua and says, man, I'm counting on you. I want you to lead us into battle. All right, Moses, what are you going to do? I'm going to go up on the hill. Now, that's almost humorous to me. I'm sure Joshua didn't doubt this for a single second, but I would. Like, Moses, you want me to go out on the field and fight while you stand on the mountain? Really? <laughs> Joshua knew, though, that Moses was going to take that staff in hand. 
and that he would be making intercession for the people and that somehow, some way, God was going to use Moses to bring him victory. That's an important lesson. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes we can't wrap our minds around it. You want me to march around the walls of Jericho and somehow, some way, we'll win by doing that? By marching? Or people today will say, you want me to get wet? I've got to go under the water to have my sins forgiven? And you see, that they're trying to somehow understand the situation. Listen, even if you don't understand it, if God says it, that settles it. Just trust God and do what God says to do. And so notice Joshua didn't bat an eye. The Bible says, so Joshua did as Moses told him. Isn't that impressive? He didn't argue. He didn't debate. He didn't say, well, I've got a few questions first. Moses says, you go fight. I'll be on the mountain. And the Bible says Joshua did as Moses told him. Great example of obedience. Well, we're introduced to three people in addition to Joshua. You've got Moses, you've got Aaron, and Hur. Aaron was Moses' brother. Hur was not a Hur. Hur was a he. Hur, according to Jewish tradition, Josephus mentions this, Hur was actually Miriam's husband. That would be Moses' brother-in-law. So while Joshua is fighting on the field, Moses... Moses' brother and Moses' brother-in-law are up on the mountain. The key point is this. Moses has that staff. The staff of God, it's called, was in his hand. Joshua goes out, begins fighting. Moses lifts that rod in the air. And as long as he has it lifted... The people of Israel prevail. But if he lowered his arms, the Amalekites prevailed. Can you imagine that scene unfolding? That's a lot of pressure on Moses, isn't it? I got to keep this up or we're going to lose. For the first maybe few minutes, your adrenaline would be high and you'd probably do okay. But after a while, man, whew, it's getting tired, right? It's like, ugh, ugh. What are we going to do here? i got to keep this up. But Moses wasn't like Amar. He was like those kids in school, right? Before long, his arm's coming down again. And so notice what happened. Oh, I'm, I want to mention this. Those Amalekites, I told you they were nasty, vicious people. It's important to note that elsewhere we're told how the Amalekites attacked. Notice Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 and 18. Never forget what the Amalekites did to you as you came from Egypt. They attacked you when you were exhausted and weary, and they struck down those who were straggling behind. They had no fear of God. This gives us some additional insight. Did the Amalekites attack from the front like men? No, they attacked from the back. The Bible says that they attacked and struck down those who were straggling behind. That's the way the devil operates today. Did you know that? In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5, Paul is talking about, I believe, a special circumstance where the people of God in the first century were enduring great persecution. And Paul says some things there that I believe are applicable to that particular situation. But he says in verse 5 that, look, if it's necessary, you and your wife can abstain from, from each other for a time. But Paul's quick to say, but not too long, lest Satan slip in and tempt you for your lack of self-control. What is he saying there? Satan's a smart being. He's going to recognize weakness. He's going to sense vulnerability. Right? And that's what the Amalekites did. They sensed weakness. First, they saw that they were wandering in the wilderness, that they were exhausted and weary. What better time to fight somebody than when they're worn out, right? But in addition to that, they said, you know what? Let's just pick off the weakest links. We'll come up from behind and, and we'll start killing the stragglers. I'm thankful God wants us to assemble together on the first day of the week 
There are a lot of great reasons why we assemble. But one is to keep us strong. Have you ever watched on Animal Channel or whatever when a lion approaches a group of animals? And they'll typically, they'll pick off the prey, those who are kind of lingering on the outside. In this camp, it would have been the elderly, the sick, the women and children, maybe those who are just discouraged, kind of lingering behind, right? When we do that, we're in dangerous territory. Satan knew that, the Amalekites knew that. And notice that last line. They had no fear of God. That was the Amalekites' biggest mistake. They had no fear of God. Well, the battle is going on. Moses, his brother and brother-in-law are on the hill. Notice what happened, verse 12. But Moses' hands grew weary. I get that. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. After a while, this is predictable, Moses gets tired. Man, it's the heat of the day. The battle is going on and on. He starts to grow weary. And so Aaron and her, they first get him a stone to sit on. Right? That's practical. Makes sense. And then they each grab an arm. Her, you grab that arm. I got this one. Moses, we're going to help you. <laughs> and you know, I try to envision the Bible. It helps me to retain what I read. I try to like play out scenes in my mind. And I just picture like, for instance, Joshua on one side. And at first he has no trouble. Right? I got you, Moses. We're good. But after a few minutes, he's going to get tired too, right? And so before long, you almost picture him like holding it up with his back for a while, maybe holding it up with a knee, right? Just trying to keep that arm raised because that was the key to success. As long as the arms are raised, the people will prevail. By the way, it's also worth pointing out that Jews prayed with their hands up, extended toward heaven. I know we pray opposite today. We typically bow our heads and fold our hands. The Jews lifted their eyes towards heaven. They raised their hands to God. And so most people see this not just as holding up the staff, but a sign of intercession. Moses is pleading to God for the people. What a powerful example of prayer, right? James tells us that there's power in prayer. Do we take advantage of it? No. And then we wonder why we're losing wars. Why Satan's getting the upper hand. Well, they held his hand steady. Listen to this. They held his hand steady until the going down of the sun. So hours have passed by. But that staff is still raised. And as a result, Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Now, let me ask you a question. Who should the credit go to? Who won this war? Was it Moses? You say, man, Moses, that was hard work. No, it wasn't Moses. Not really. Was it Aaron or her? No. How about Joshua? He's on the battlefield. He's fighting with the sword in hand. What, was it Joshua? No. If we were to read the final few verses... They refer to God as our banner. He was the source of their victory. Did man play a part? Yes. But man can take no credit. That victory belonged to God. And let me tell you, every victory we have in life belongs to God. Amen. Amen. Well, the lesson here I hope is obvious. We need each other. We can't do it on our own. What if Moses had gotten on that mountain by himself? Would this story have ended the same way? Probably not. Right? We're told that after a while his arm got weary. And if he lowered his arm, the people were going to lose. If Moses had gone up on the mountain by himself, this would have had a tragic ending. But because he was smart enough to take helpers along, a support staff along, they were able to prevail. I read about a well named Mila. 
mile of the well is in a huge Arctic tank in China at some aquarium. Well, one day, the aquarium was having a diving contest, and a 26-year-old female named Yang Yun dove into that Arctic pool. As soon as she hit the water, her leg began cramping severely. She started sinking. Her leg was paralyzed, and she immediately thought, I'm going to drown to death. But just as she got to the bottom... Mila the well appeared. Mila swooped under her, grabbed her gently by one leg, and lifted her up to the top. Here are pictures of that event. The well swooped in and lifted her up when she could not lift herself up. And that's really the point and purpose of this message. We all need a mile of the well, don't we? You remember when Cain asked God, and he did it condescendingly, Am I my brother's keeper? The resounding answer is yes. Yes, I am my brother's keeper. I understand that we're going to give an account to God as individuals, but make no mistake about it, this is an us religion. We have to rely on God, and we have to rely on others. We all need an Aaron and her. We all need a meal of the well. There are going to be times in life, we've all experienced it, when we simply can't do it alone. We're worried. We're wearied. We're downtrodden. We're depressed. There are times in life when for whatever reason we just can't do it by ourselves and we have to depend on others. There has to be somebody to come along and lift up our arm when it grows tired. Amen. I think about all the one another passages in Scripture. I think there are like 60 of them that pertain to our relationship as Christians. I'll just give you a few. We're told to love one another, be devoted to one another, build up one another, accept one another, admonish one another, greet one another, care for one another, serve one another, bear one another's burdens, be kind and compassionate to one another, look to the interest of one another, teach one another, comfort one another, encourage one another, exhort one another, stir up one another to love and good works. Do you get the point? This is a one another religion. God calls us to be part of the body. We're not the whole body by ourselves. We're just a part of the body. And brethren, there are times when we all need a helping hand. I appreciate Ricky when he prayed. He prayed for those who are suffering among us. And did you notice he said, and we pray that they'll let us know so we can help. I thought, boy, that goes right along with my message. If we don't know you're hurting, how can we help you? If we don't know you're struggling, how can we serve you? When we become Christians, usually, we start out strong. We're on fire for the Lord. We have no problem lifting our hands for God. But inevitably, I don't care who you are, inevitably, over time, that arm's going to grow weary. It's going to start to strain. And we're going to be tempted to put it down. At those moments, Satan is lurking. As a roaring lion, remember 1 Peter 5? As a roaring lion, he's just ready to pounce. And it's crucial that in those moments, we have Christian brothers and sisters to come along and lift that hand back up. That's my prayer for today, that North Point will always be a place of helping hands. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we do want to pray your blessings upon this congregation. You've brought us so far so fast. We're thankful for that. We're thankful for the love that exists here. We're thankful for the unity that exists here. And Father, we pray that you'll help us to look out for one another, to be an encourager, to be a support to those who are struggling. When we grow weary, give us the humility to tell people and give us Give us the uh, passion, Father, to be mindful of others and to help others. You gave the children of Israel victory that day. And we know, Father, that if we're faithful, you'll give us the victory too. We're so thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you're here this morning and not a child of God, you can't win the war if you don't first enlist.
in God's army. You ready to enlist? You can do that by believing on the Lord, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Jesus, and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. If you'll take those simple steps, you'll contact the blood and come out of that water born again. You'll be on the road that leads to eternal life. You'll also become part of our family. And as your brothers and sisters, we'll be here to lift you up and push you on. If you need to obey the gospel, don't delay. Please come as we stand and sing.